Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this evening. Um, good morning to all those who've joined us from Canada, including Jeff Leon, and good evening to all our participants from India. I am um, Nadira Hamid. I'm the CEO of the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber, or ICBC, as it is popularly known. Uh, ICBC is the only bilateral chamber based in India, which is dedicated to promoting economic and uh, business ties between India and Canada. We have a pan-India presence. We are present in Bengaluru, in Mumbai, Calcutta, Ahmedabad, and headquartered in New Delhi. Uh, we, are, we have members from different sectors, and our membership consists of Indian companies in Canada, Canadian companies in India. We work very closely with the government and industry in both India and Canada. And amongst our membership, we are very privileged to have a very leading Canadian organization who is our member, which is Air Canada. They, are, uh, they have supported us and contributed immensely to the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber. And we are very, very happy that they are here with us in this partnership. Together with Air Canada, ICBC had the privilege to launch the Leader Speak series, which we began last year. And uh, these are a series of uh, fireside chats between eminent dignitaries of India and Canada, in which we discuss various issues, uh, important sectors uh, between India and Canada. And, and we get the perspectives both from the Indian side and the Canadian side. Before I go on to introduce the session, uh, let me say a quick word about our partners, Air Canada. So Air Canada, in fact, has been very instrumental in, uh, in encouraging business and trade and the economy between India and Canada by their, by their efforts at connectivity. I don't know if all of who all have used Air Canada. I certainly have all the time when I travel to Canada. Air Canada has started direct flights from India to Canada, which has, be, which has been of tremendous value for business because people find it much easier to travel straight uh, rather than going via places. And this has been a great achievement for their very dynamic uh, head of operations and uh, general manager, uh, Mr. Arun Pandya, uh, who heads their, uh, you know, the India, who is their country head for India. Uh, we, I think Air Canada now has flights, direct flights from Delhi to Toronto. Uh, I think that's almost daily. Delhi to uh, Delhi to Vancouver, Mumbai to Vancouver, and now lately they have launched Delhi Montreal. So hats off to you, Arun, uh, for this initiative. And I think Air Canada deserves a great uh, deserves a lot of credit for having introduced this initiative. And uh, and uh, thank you, Arun, for always supporting the chamber. And we are uh, you know very pleased to have this session in partnership. With, uh, with yourselves. Uh, another thing that the chamber does is address many, many different sectors, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is mining, whether it is health, uh, health tech, whether it is agri-tech, et cetera. There are numerous sectors that we are addressing. But while we were doing that, we realized that there's a key sector which all these different areas depend on and which is the legal side. I mean, any business that wants to open in India or India wants to open in Canada, whether they want to expand, whether they want to, you know, uh, to change, diversify, expand anything, they need, they need a legal structure to refer to. And India and Canada have different law structures and people don't really know very much about it. So we realize that this, we, we really need to have an awareness of this legal system to our participants, to our membership, which is very important. And wherever there is, uh, you know, wherever there is a legal structure uh, and for any business there is always gives rise to a little bit of arbitration, dispute resolutions. So we decided to, you know, to have this session and we were very privileged, very, in fact, honored to have and the eminent presence of leading uh, leading people from this sector on this session. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Justice Mittal. Uh, uh, Justice Mittal is the 
former Chief Justice of JNK High Court and former Acting Chief Justice and Judge of Delhi High Court, India. And she is in conversation with Jeffrey Leon, partner Bennett Jones, LLP, member arbitrator and mediator, Arbitration Place, Toronto, Canada. This session has been facilitated by Niti Sajdeva, Secretary General and Registrar at MCIA and moderated by Jafar Alam, the dynamic partner at Trilegal. Um, now, without taking any more time, let me hand it over to the actual people who are going to be speaking. And I would now uh, like to invite Niti Sajdeva to please take this on. And uh, once more, I would like to thank Arun Pandya, who is the country head and general manager, Indian subcontinent at Air Canada. And I would like to thank Air Canada for partnering us on this initiative. Over to you, Niti. Thank you so much, Nadira. Uh, good morning, good evening to everybody present today. Um, I would first like to thank ICBC and Air Canada for thinking uh, you know, this important topic of uh, legal uh, sector, uh, which is very important, of course, for people doing business within India and Canada. And I think um, starting off on this legal sector under the leadership, thought leadership, uh, we have today the topic of dispute resolution. Uh, I would say is even more apt because anybody in business would often seem and find themselves to be not very far off from the disputes as well. So it becomes even more important to discuss about the issues of dispute resolution. Um, as many of you may be aware, the two-way merchandise trade between the two countries, which is India and Canada, has been at $10.1 billion in 2019 and is set to increase in the next few years. Now, India offers a tremendous investment opportunities for Canadian companies in emerging sectors like transportation, infrastructure, life sciences, clean energy, uh, technology, etc., the government of the two countries are looking at all possible avenues to deepen the investment relationship between the two. You must be wondering, why am I talking all about all of this, what the government wants and what the trade in the business is? The reason is that because where there is trade and business involved, the chances of a dispute arising are not too remote. It is usually that while parties are negotiating their contracts and focus on the economic and financial terms of a contract, they often neglect to reflect upon the dispute resolution clause. And that is why the dispute resolution clauses are also often called as the champagne clause. That is to say that when the champagne glasses are being you know, taken and the contracts are being signed, all of a sudden there would be one side lawyer who would ask a junior lawyer to just copy paste a dispute resolution clause and put it in there. However, once a dispute arises, it is just impossible to go back in time and to redraft your dispute resolution clause. Now, while a dispute resolution clause may not help in avoiding a dispute, but as you know, it is said that a well-oiled dispute resolution clause clearly helps in making the process efficient and effective. Now, broadly, the parties could either resolve their disputes by going to the court, and in today's scenario, what we are talking about, which is a cross-border transaction between India and Canada, the parties could either see themselves resolving a dispute in a Canadian court or maybe in an Indian court. Another avenue which may be open is to resolve their disputes by arbitration, and of course, is also by mediation. It could also be a combination of arbitration and mediation. Now, while each of them have their pros and cons and may be suitable in a given circumstance, we at MCIA are leading the effort to provide parties an efficient and effective mechanism to resolve their commercial disputes by administering the disputes under the MCIA arbitration rules. For parties or members who are joining from Canada, institutional arbitration may be well heard of, but this is a concept which is still in a nascent stage in India. And the efforts are made by the government, by the judiciary, and also by the legislation to make sure that at least for the commercial disputes, institutional arbitration 
and the effective means of resolving disputes resolution is now at the forefront. Today, we have the experts from India and Canada who will help you understand the nuances of dispute resolution by these three methods. We sincerely hope that today's session, you will be better equipped to resolve your disputes, if any, and focus your energies in doing business. I once again thank ICBC Air Canada, especially Nadira, Arun, and Shivani for putting this together. And of course, to Justice Mittal and Jeff, without whom we would not have been able to put all of this together. And I would fail in my duty if I do not thank Jaffa for putting all these agenda together to make sure that it is well moderated and all your questions are answered. My only question to the audience is that you have two partners, one from an Indian law firm and one from a Canadian law firm who would answer your calling you. And not very often that you will have a judge sitting there who will give her views without dictating them as an order. So take advantage of this situation have all your answer questions answered without having to spend any money or the dictum of the court. Over to you, Jaffa, and all the very best for an interesting session that I look forward to. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, good evening, Justice Mithal. Uh, good morning, Jeff. Uh, you're both uh, preeminent voices uh, in arbitration and dispute resolution. Uh, and it is indeed a privilege uh, and an honor to have you among us. Um, and I'm sure that our audience will benefit greatly from your thoughts and wisdom from the many years of experience that both of you have had. Uh, Justice Mittal uh, on the bench and uh, you, Jeff, on the bar. Uh, with the very elaborate background that uh, Niti has helped us with, um, we're going to obviously traverse uh, quite a bit of ground. So I'll, I'll try and get down to it uh, with both of you immediately. Uh, Justice Mittal, with you first. Uh, like uh, Ms. Hamid and Niti said, disputes are obviously uh, going to arise when one does business. Uh, and therefore, just like many other choices that one makes when one is entering into a contract with another person, uh, it is good hygiene to agree, uh, for instance, on jurisdiction, on where, which courts one might go to. In your view and from your experience, um, for a business, for businesses that have a presence both in Canada and India, um, uh, or the contract involves businesses in both these jurisdictions, uh, do you? What are the things that a business should keep in mind where it has the ability to make a choice, uh, and when does it have the ability to make a choice uh, between Indian courts and Canadian courts? You know. Um, uh... Having been a lawyer in India for 23 years and a judge for 16, you would expect an obvious answer would be India. You know, <laughs> the come to India, we offer you a great country. We have very well entrenched legal systems. We have a very robust arbitration bar and very competent arbitrators who are working in the field. But uh, there are a few. There are there's more than that just uh, more than just being an Indian in promoting or advocating India. You know, if we compare the two legal systems, you know, if you look at the legal regime for enforcement uh, in India and Canada, you know, we, India was an original signatory and a contracting state to the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, uh, which came into existence in 1958 and which is popularly known as the New York Convention. And Canada is also a contracting state to the New York Convention. Now, India has incorporated the provisions of the convention in the arbitration and domestic law in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, where, which makes uh, an award, a foreign award, uh, as recognized and, and enforceable in India, so long as the foreign country is the party to the New York Convention, and the central government has notified in the official gazette that it has reciprocal provisions with such territory. Now, Canada, awards made in Canada fulfill the requirements of Section 44 and therefore are legally recognized and enforced as such. And therefore, any arbitration, since Canada is also a contracting party to the New York Convention, there is an element of reciprocity 
and any arbitration award made in India is also legally recognized and enforceable in Canada. Also, there is a lot of compatibility and predictability in arbit the arbitration legal regime of India and Canada. You know, the domestic legislations, you know, that is the local legislations, local laws in both the countries are based on the ancestral model laws. Therefore, the rules applicable to an arbitration which is seated in either in India or in Canada are consistent with each other. And the uniformity in the two legal regimes will permit Canadian parties to share similar expectations and rewards for arbitration in India and vice versa. So what will actually guide business houses, Jafar, in um, uh, making a choice of jurisdiction would primarily be their business conveniences, the costs entailed, the availability of their choice, the a lawyer of their choice, you know, and uh, such like expectations, convenience of travel, etc. And um, so, you know, I, I thought it my duty to point out that we are very, very similar, you know. And uh, if you are aware that Canada and India are in the final stages of negotiations of the, what is the acronym is CEPA, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which would enable Canadian businesses to soon enjoy various free trade protections requiring investments and assets to be placed in India. Now, such assets would need reliable and familiar dispute resolution systems. And arbitration in India offers a very valuable you know, option to the pitfalls of litigation in Canada or, um, or in India, protracted with, or uh, the, you know, which may be uh, very cost, uh, costly to the party, but also it ensures uh, there will be expedition in the resolution of the disputes. But before I part here, I must congratulate the ICBC for organizing this um, session. Very far-sighted, and I think it is very timely. Nadira Shivani, Arun Pandya, um, kudos to you for thinking about this. And um, it has been wonderful interacting with both Neeti Sajdeva and you, Jafar, in the in the sessions that we have had for leading up to the today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Mukherjee. It's been a pleasure for all of us. Uh, turning to you, uh, Jeff, and drawing from what uh, Justice Mukherjee has uh, told us, um, do you do you feel like Canadian businesses uh, that are in business with Indian businesses um, or in contract with them would have a natural affinity to take their disputes to to, to the Canadian courts, and similarly for Indian businesses? Uh, would want to take their Canadian counterparts uh, in dispute before uh, the Indian courts? Would there, uh, uh, what are the kinds of things that these businesses should keep in mind um, when they choose a forum uh, right at the stage or when they're contracting? Sure, well, let me uh, start by uh, echoing uh, Justice Mattel and thank you for uh, involving me in this uh, excellent uh, program. And uh, in considering this, it's, it's interesting, uh, Justice and I uh, looked at it separately, but uh, I came to the same uh, conclusion uh, that uh, she did, that while our judicial systems between Canada and India are distinct, there are many, many similarities. And I think uh, uh, people in, in India and people in Canada can take some uh, comfort from the fact that uh, we both have common law systems and common law procedures uh, in, in our uh, judicial system. Uh, and what I, I think in, in responding to your question, I'm going to focus on uh, the judicial system as opposed to our, our arbitration uh, process. Um, and my, my main point is that I believe that uh, Indian investors can be confident that the Canadian judicial system will treat them fairly. Um, there is not within Canada a significant, what we call a uh, home court uh, advantage uh, in that sense. Uh, our courts are appoint, uh, our judges, I think, strive to, to uh, 
uh, be fair, uh, Canada appreciates that um, there are occasions where, where foreign litigants may not feel totally at home in, in Canada, and I think we strive to, to try and, uh, and deal with that. Um, the, uh, our judges, as you may know, are appointed federally, but our, our court system uh, is based on a provincial uh, jurisdiction. And there are some differences between different provinces, um, but I'm gonna focus a bit in my remarks on Ontario, which is my home jurisdiction. Um, you know, the key issue, uh, if you want to litigate in, in courts in, in Canada is uh, I think obviously, do you have a viable legal basis uh, for, for your claim? Um, and uh, I think you will find that in Canada, uh, we have uh, skilled uh, trial lawyers um, who uh, are able to, to handle all sorts of disputes. Um, the, uh, in Ontario, our judges have um, varied backgrounds and, and experience. Um, however, um, particularly in Toronto, uh, Ontario, there's been created a, a commercial list to deal solely with uh, commercial matters. And the judges who sit on that panel uh, do have uh, commercial experience. And the, the unique feature uh, of that uh, uh, commercial list is that um, while um, it deals with only a, lim a limited range of commercial disputes, it also is attuned to the fact that sometimes commercial disputes require uh, to them to be resolved in real time. And uh, that our court is prepared where it's uh, necessary to accommodate that. Um, now, we have, uh, I think, uh, some backlog in our courts as well that's been exacerbated by uh, COVID. But I think it's also true that um, as a result of, of COVID, there are new opportunities for having uh, disputes resolved on a timely uh, basis uh, through the use of, to a certain extent, virtual hearings, which would allow for uh, participation uh, from uh, different uh, locations, uh, as well as hybrid hearings, where part of the hearing is dealt with uh, virtually and, and partly um, in, uh, in, in, law, in uh, live. Um, in generally speaking, and it's hard to, to estimate this, but uh, it's possible to get a case to trial uh, in Ontario within one to two years, or although for longer cases, um, the, the, uh, it can take um, uh, certainly uh, more time than, than, than that. Um, and um, our courts do strive though to uh, accommodate litigants by moving cases along and, and uh, as, as quickly as, as possible. So um, for many types of cases, and we may get into this a, a bit later, um, our courts require that the parties first attempt to resolve their disputes through mediation. Uh, and that sometimes is a requirement before you can have your case uh, set down for trial. But um, it is well established and well recognized uh, in, uh, in, in Canada that, um, uh, that the use of private mediation or sometimes even a judicial mediation is an important factor in, in trying to get uh, re disputes resolved on a timely basis. Um, you know, the, the reality is that in our court system, uh, getting a case to trial um, can be uh, somewhat uh, costly, um, both in terms of time and in actual uh, monetary cost, particularly um, in terms of the extent to which there, there's required documentary production and, and oral discovery. Uh, but um, again, um, our courts try to, or our judges try to deal with matters in a way that um, uh, acknowledges the fact that uh, you know, business people uh, expect uh, a, uh, a judicial system that deals with uh, uh, issues in a uh, timely basis on a and on a reasonable basis. 
uh, but we'll, we can get into that a bit more too when we talk about arbitration and, and, and some of the differences. Um, the one factor that has to be recognized is, is if you get judgment in, in Canada, you, you may still need to enforce it. Um, that can uh, give rise to, to some issues. Um, and I think the, the fact is that, uh, as uh, Justice Minto alluded to, um, sometimes arbitral decisions can be uh, more readily enforced as a result of the, uh, the New York Convention. But uh, let me just uh, conclude by, by saying, on this point, by saying that um, I do think uh, that uh, in, in considering Canada as a, a jurisdiction, it is important <clears throat> to recognize that, that our systems have been developing, and particularly now where uh, virtual proceedings are, uh, are so prevalent that uh, and our courts are moving at least uh, finally to, to modern procedures uh, that use technology. Um, there is uh, very much to uh, recommend um, Canada as a jurisdiction in, in which to have uh, disputes resolved. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that's, that's very comforting to know that the Canadian courts are similar to ours uh, and are doing their best to accommodate all litigants uh, and resolve their disputes as objectively as possible. And I, I should add as a litigator who's been practicing in the Indian courts for a long time, uh, the endeavor of the Indian courts is, uh, is not dissimilar at all. And Justice Mittal will bear me out. The effort here is uh, also to speed uh, decision-making and keep it as fair and objective as possible. Uh, speaking, as you said, uh, to uh, the hoary traditions of, of the common law, uh, which, the, which both countries share. Of course, uh, uh, we uh, Indian courts do have the facility of the Commercial Courts Act um, uh, and of arbitration, as well as uh, the scope that uh, the many treaties that the Indian uh, state has signed uh, that enable the enforcement of uh, foreign decrees as well as foreign awards in India. Uh, but drawing uh, uh, one additional point that I wanted to add, of course, comfort and practicality, as Justice Mittal said, is an important consideration in choosing one's forum. Um, and uh, also, you know, where the assets are located uh, might be a constraining factor. And so therefore, uh, you know, where you feel like it might, uh, you might have some assets that you can seize uh, if it comes to that. Uh, uh, or if you have to enforce uh, your judgment, it may be an important concern to keep in mind, a consideration to keep in mind uh, when you choose your forum. Uh, Jeff, uh, in terms of uh, a perception of fairness, um, um, it does help, right, uh, that you, are, you have a multi-person arbitral tribunal uh, where the disputants uh, you know, if there's two sides uh, and not more, uh, can choose an arbitrator each and the arbitrators then uh, choose a chair. Um, that adds perhaps uh, to how fair a system might be or might be perceived to be, how fair the decision might be perceived to be. Uh, if the Canadian courts are, of course, as objective as they are and so speedy, uh, as you say, matters can reach uh, a conclusion within a year or two. Um, do you feel like there is that much of an advantage uh, for parties uh, to go to resort to arbitration vis-a-vis um, -vis the Canadian courts? Um, it's a, an interesting, uh, an interesting question. And, uh, you know, when I, I say disputes can be resolved in a, a year or two, that's often a year or two from the time that it's ready for trial. Um, so there's a lot of time spent leading up to that in terms of uh, the, uh, the pre-trial procedures. Um, arbitration in Canada is, is very, very well established. Um, we have uh, excellent arbitrators uh, here with, um, uh, I think, uh, worldwide uh, reputations as being uh, neutral and, and fair. We also have um, excellent facilities here for, for dealing with arbitrations. Um, arbitration Place, which is uh, uh, which I'm affiliated with, uh, was one of the, the first um, uh, facilities that um, 
uh, began holding virtual proceedings when the, the pandemic first began. And uh, we have the, uh, an excellent ability to deal with both in-person uh, proceedings and, and virtual or, or hybrid proceedings. Um, I think uh, it, it's fair to say uh, that um, all jurisdictions in Canada, that is all the provinces have modern arbitration laws. Um, and some are geared uh, specifically to, to commercial disputes. One factor that I think is important to give this some context is that Canadian courts have, have declared forcefully that they support arbitration and that they will not intervene um, other than on very limited issues such as jurisdiction, uh, due process or, or public policy. And there's been a, a clear statement from our uh, highest court of the Supreme Court of Canada that judges should respect the, the arbitral process. I think historically Canada has been viewed uh, as a, a neutral jurisdiction. Um, you know, we have a history uh, in Canada of, uh, of bilingualism. We're, we're used to dealing with um, uh, different uh, language issues. Um, we, uh, and those are uh, accommodate, uh, accommodated. And so Canada, I think, is a very um, excellent seat of, of arbitration. Um, now, as you know, um, many um, uh, uh, commercial agreements uh, contain arbitration clauses. And again, um, our courts uh, will um, forcefully uh, require those parties that have agreed to arbitration to, to stay with arbitration and not uh, attempt to have other, their um, disputes otherwise dealt with uh, through the judicial system. And also there's a, a great tradition of, of ad hoc agreements that parties enter into um, when a dispute arises. I just uh, myself dealt with um, uh, as arbitrator with a dispute that uh, arose during the uh, pandemic where there was no arbitration clause, but the parties felt that the better uh, way to deal with this was, was through arbitration. And I think the, the reality is that in Canada, you can have as much confidence in arbitrators and the arbitral process as you can with judges and, and Canadian uh, and our courts. Uh, in terms of why you might choose arbitration as opposed to the um, are using the courts, I think, um, as you uh, alluded to, one of the main reasons is the ability to choose your uh, decision maker or decision makers, whether it's a panel, whether it's a sole arbitrator or a panel of three arbitrators. You can choose uh, individuals that have um, commercial uh, experience uh, and um, who are well skilled in resolving disputes, uh, whether um, because they are have, as frequently the case, uh, had had have had judicial careers and have now moved on to, to private arbitration, or uh, whether uh, they're, uh, they're individuals like myself who have a a uh, long background in uh, resolving disputes through litigation and apply those skills as a a neutral in, in arbitration. The, the one factor that I think is important to keep in mind, and this is true of, of arbitration everywhere, is that um, arbitration allows the parties uh, privacy and confidentiality. Uh, and I think that is, is critical in commercial disputes. Uh, our courts here uh, have recently said that uh, if you choose to go to court, then you accept the fact that court is a, a public forum and uh, you can't really uh, then uh, uh, accept in um, very limited circumstances, expect that your, your dispute can be resolved privately. I think the reality is that I think arbitration here does offer um, flexibility and the ability to have your disputes resolved quickly. Um, parties can either in their arbitration agreement or when the dispute arises can define the process. And often there's a, a choice that has to be made. You can have effectively a private trial 
through uh, arbitration that looks very much like a, a trial in a court, or you can opt for what is in effect real arbitration where there is limited uh, oral and documentary discovery. There are time limits imposed. Uh, you have a, uh, an efficient hearing uh, and there are skilled arbitrators that can uh, ensure that if the parties want their dispute resolved on a timely basis, that it will be resolved on a timely basis. Now, you, you do pay for that process, um, but uh, I think often the savings that can occur by having a, a, an arbitration process in terms of its efficiency and cost uh, effectiveness um, can uh, outweigh the, the cost of, of having to, to pay your, your decision makers. Um, the other aspect of arbitration in, in that I should emphasize is that um, our courts have re respected arbitration in terms of its finality. There are often uh, arbitration agreements provide that there is no or very limited appeals and our courts again have held that they will not interfere um, in, in with the decision of an arbitrator except in very limited circumstances where they uh, you know, apply a very high standard in order to, uh, to, for the court even to, to engage. Um, so uh, we, Canada is a party to the, the New York Convention, which facilitates enforcement of, of arbitral uh, awards. Uh, and so there is uh, much to recommend arbitration. Uh, I think uh, people can have confidence it, that uh, arbitration uh, held in, in Canada or before Canadian arbiters will, uh, they will get a fair hearing before uh, an independent and skilled decision maker. And um, again, I, I repeat here that, you know, with the, our virtual world now expanding, um, I think arbitration can be even more cost effective because the, the extent to which people have to travel, particularly for dealing with preliminary matters, uh, it can be uh, curtailed by having a, uh, a, a hybrid hearing, which I think makes uh, arbitration even, um, even more uh, uh, attractive. Um, so in, in general, I think um, you, there are pros and cons to, uh, to both uh, dealing with your disputes in, in court as opposed to dealing with them through arbitration, but certainly there is much to recommend in terms of the arbitral process. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Justice Mittal, uh, there are obviously um, um, many commonalities between the two jurisdictions in terms of principle, uh, in terms of a large pool of talented arbitrators and lawyers uh, who might help parties resolve their disputes and a very long tradition of arbitration in India as well. Uh, so there's, uh, there are, in everything that Jeff said, uh, I, I felt like there's a lot uh, that mm. would recommend arbitration in India too, for those reasons. Uh, would you, how do you think the Indian, Jeff, Jeff obviously thinks the Canadian courts are doing a great job of engendering uh, and further strengthening, uh, uh, you know, using the arbitration mechanism to resolve disputes. What's your sense about how Indian courts are faring and have they acquitted themselves well? Have they evolved well uh, to accommodate arbitration and to strengthen it? Um, I think you as a litigator and with such extensive experience at the bar would agree that uh, the Indian experience is not very different. And what is even more uh, special and unique is that not only the courts, but even the legislature has kept, uh, is marching in time to the needs of the commercial world. You know, for instance, arbitration in courts is uh, now premised on minimal court intervention. And primarily because of both, because of the decisions of the courts, as well as the legislative amendments, you know, and advancements. You know, we were having, uh, there was a vacuum in the Indian uh, arbitration law with regard to emergency awards, you know, and uh, an emergency award the, was upheld by the Supreme Court of India in a very recent decision on 6th of August, 2021 in, the, in a dispute 
raised by Amazon.com in the investment holdings LLC, wherein the Supreme Court recognized the legal validity of an emergency award without any legislative intervention, without any legislative provision for an emergency award in our arbitration laws. Then in another yet uh, recent decision in November 2019, 27th November to be exact, in a case, in an appeal taken by Hindustan Construction Company Limited, the Supreme Court has struck down a legislative provision. Section 87 was struck down in order to expand the pro-arbitration features which were introduced in earlier amendments. And just like in Canada, you know, a party who has brought a civil action or a suit will be non-suited mandatorily if there is an arbitration agreement. If it, uh, it or he or she has entered into an arbitration agreement with the defendant and he or she will have to take recourse to arbitration to resolve the dispute for which they have filed the litigation. A judicial intervention and judicial review has also been reduced increasingly by way of legislative amendments. You know, you are aware that the arbitration regime was old and outdated. We had an Arbitration Act of 1940, which came to be re re replaced by the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, which not only extensively modernized the entire legislation, legislation relating to arbitration, but also in statutorily recognized conciliation. And it, uh, just like in Canada, you know, an arbitration award can be uh, set aside on very, very few grounds set down in Section 34 of our Act of 1996. And public policy was one of the grounds, an award which was opposed to public policy. And uh, in every challenge to an arbitration award was premised on a, on this ground that the award was opposed to public policy. Now, without any statutory definition of what would be included in public policy or opposed to public policy, it was very difficult for courts to arrive at, uh, you know, there was no uniformity in what was uh, resulting in the judicial decision making. So in the legislature saw the difficulty which was arising because of this provision. And in 2015, by a statutory amendment, the contours of public policy were clarified and the scope of challenge to an arbitration award was curtailed you know, um, by the amendment to section 34 of the act. Now in 2019, you see a recognition of the importance of institutional arbitrations. You know, now, we have two manners of arbitration. One is what is commonly called as ad hoc arbitrations, where parties nominate an arbitrator or an arbitral tribunal, and um, you know they evolve their own procedure on agreed terms with the parties and proceed on that. The second is there are institutions, arbitral institutions like the Mumbai you know, Center for International Arbitration, MCIA, of which Neeti is the registrar, and you have the uh, ICADR, you have the Nani Palikivala Arbitration Center, you have several court annexed arbitration centers which are very popular, Delhi International Arbitration Center. I had, uh, you know, set up and uh, inaugurated arbit international arbitration centers in Jammu and Kashmir, you know, which were called the Jammu Kashmir International Arbitration Centers. They had two offices, one in Srinagar and one in Jammu. So, you know, there was, uh, there's a, with these centers coming up, you know, th there was no legislative recognition. And in 2019, an amendment was effected, enabling parties to go to an arbitral institution and a nomination of an arbitrator by this institution, which would be binding on the parties, such nomination. So therefore, the, you know, we have Section 11 of the Arbitration Act, which enables courts to appoint arbitrators if parties do not, uh, parties to an arbitration agreement do not nominate despite a notice from the other side. But uh, so, you know, there have been both the judiciary and the legislature have actually marched hand in hand, hand and have responded very sharply and very quickly to the needs of um, expedi expedition to the need of uh, in, to remove, reducing the formality to the arbitration process so that parties can 
resolve disputes in a manner as well as with our uh, outcomes which are acceptable to both of them jeff has pointed it out i don't need to repeat but it's very similar the biggest advantage and why parties look at arbitration is not only for cost saving or, or to avoid the delays which may happen in courts but because they get a opportunity to choose not only the arbitrator but the process which will really be followed by in resolving the dispute so you have a choice you know of the manner in which you will file your claims counter claims defense you choose as to whether you will lead oral evidence or rely on affidavits or only rely on documentary evidence a lot of the formalities which are provided with the, for regard to procedure governing court proceedings can be immediately obviated or deleted and you you take shortcuts to reach the final stage of requesting the arbitrator to look at the material which is available before the arbitrator to pass the award so you know there is this huge comfort level that you have chosen the arbitrator but of course you don't have a control over the outcome here there is still adjudication i think you may be asking us about mediation a little later but in india the legislature in responding to the needs of expedition and commercial disputes you know you see the enactment you mentioned the commercial courts act we have dedicated jurisdictions you know you have a commercial court division at the uh, or the entry level point you have a commercial appellate division of the high court you have dedicated commercial courts even in district courts now and uh, these streamline the hearing of commercial cases including arbitration again very strict timelines are provided by law for the decisions of different or for completing different stages of the suit and uh, you know you also have uh, the 2015 amendment to the arbitration act has given more powers to the courts and to the arbitrator to grant interim relief and securing additional protections of assets uh, you know which may be the subject matter of the arbitration proceedings or which one party may want to keep as a security for protecting and for ensuring execution of, of an award which is ultimately passed also you know in india we have the advantage of the presence of globally recognized institutions you know you know we have uh, the icc the lcia and ciac the singapore international arbitration center all maintain offices in india providing full services and uh, you know the uh, neeti didn't say it but i understand that institutional arbitration has become so popular that mci saw a 150% rise in the uh, increase in the case load of mci in 2020 over the last year so you know the statutory amendments have placed especially the 2019 institutional arbitration that sent the stage and uh, we also find that an arbitration council of india has been conceptualized so there will be recognition there will be accreditation there will be of institutions and uh, there will be definitely an improvement in the services which these arbitration institutions will be rendering we also have very well very good facilities for conducting arbitration and uh, parties from all over not only across pan india but across the globe are are arbitrating in india i am also sitting as an arbitrator in cases where you know thanks because of it happened because of the pandemic but i think it may become a way of life but where one of us one of the arbitral tribunal members is sitting in dubai uh, in the middle east and the chair is sitting in london you know so we do uh, you know this has also become possible that you can have arbitrators sitting across the globe so probably there may be some day when jeff and i are on the same page and arbitrating in the same case he is doing it from canada and i am doing it in india and we have a chair from singapore you know and we may not need to move parties will save costs as jeff has said but uh, yeah, the the you know the the options available to parties to choose the person who will decide their dispute has become absolutely large
I will look Thank forward you. to that, Justice. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> but I would like to take that no non-stop flight to Montreal, you know, <laughs> or Vancouver, <laughs> or Toronto <laughs> to do a meet arbitration with you. <laughs> Well, I hope we can all travel and and uh, be physically uh, in in the many places that I'm sure Justice Mittal uh, uh, you would like to be during arbitrations and and uh, Jeff. Um, Justice Mittal, just uh, uh, on the same theme of um, how the Indian courts have been responsive uh, in order to uh, facilitate arbitration. Um, uh, uh, do you think they fared well during uh, these COVID times as well? Uh, have, have you found them to be responsive? I mean, not you, of course, are no longer on the bench. Um, uh, but in your experience in the arbitrations that you've done, uh, where parties have needed urgent relief, uh, have they been able to resort to the courts and get that relief in India? I think so. I think so. Mm. And, this, and the same kind of virtual hearings that uh, Jeff spoke about, uh, oh yes, oh courts yes, were very oh yes, quick to oh yes, them. Delhi, no, yes, Delhi High Court had a e court from I think 2008, you know, and we were recording evidence virtually. We had, it was a paperless court, you know, the original side presiding judge, you know, where original suits were filed was always an e court in Jammu and Kashmir. I constituted benches. You know, I was very short of judges and I had two benches to control, one in Jammu and one in uh, Srinagar. So if out of three judges in one bench, two recused, I could constitute a division bench only by adding one judge who was sitting on the other bench, you know, in say Jammu, if the case was in Srinagar. So we were doing virtual hearings for long before COVID happened with one judge in Srinagar and one judge sitting in Jammu. You know. <laughs> uh, Jeff, do you think that that's very, very interesting? And I didn't know about the Jammu Kashmir High Court uh, being keeping pace with, uh, you know, uh, the Delhi High Court too. Uh, and that's, of course, thanks to uh, the leadership that it has been able to have. Um, uh, we, we were, I like to brag, we were five miles ahead. You never had, a, you never had a bench consisting of one judge in one town and the other judge in another town, you know. <laughs> A one-hour no, flight true. away. <laughs> that's probably true. Um, Jeff, do you feel like uh, th this COVID pandemic uh, is has taught us many lessons, uh, both on the arbitration side as well as in court uh, and in dispute resolution, perhaps generally um, about flexibility, um, about getting things done cheaply? Are, are, are some of these changes going to stay with us? How do you think the pandemic has affected dispute resolution? And that's a, a very interesting question. And um, I think the, the short answer to, to it is that it has had a, uh, a monumental effect uh, in terms of how um, disputes are going to be resolved into the, the future. Um, hopefully the pandemic will be over at some point, although it's not clear when that point might, might be, but um, I don't think, at least in, in Canada, um, we will go back ever to the way things were before. I, mean, I think it, it's simply become accepted now and the, uh, the technology now exists that um, it is more efficient uh, to, to deal with at least some parts of, of disputes um, uh, virtually or, or electronically. The, um, you know, particularly things like scheduling, uh, things like preliminary motions uh, and, and so forth, uh, I think are, are here to say, stay. Um, in Ontario, we have a, a, an e-filing system where uh, the most of, of the, the documents now that are used by judges are filed online in council um, and, and the judge have access to those documents. And, and so uh, really the, uh, the use of paper uh, in, in resolving disputes is becoming um, uh, somewhat outmoded, and, and I think from an environmental perspective and from an efficient perspective, that's uh, that's very uh, Im important. The um, 
uh, my hope, and you know, this remains to be seen, it, though, is that uh, we will get back to having at least some parts of proceedings dealt with uh, uh, in person. Um, I think it, particularly where you're dealing with um, witnesses and even where you're dealing uh, uh, in even in terms of the parties, I think you, know, you want to have a process in, in place where the parties uh, can see what happened and feel that their, um, their concerns, their issues have been heard and that whatever the decision is, that at least they feel that they've had a, a fair, uh, fair hearing. And uh, my own view is that it, it's harder to do that virtually than it is in, in person. So um, my hope uh, and is that um, we will get back to the point where you know, in terms of trials, in terms of, of hearing involving witnesses, uh, to, to a significant extent, it will be dealt with uh, in person, perhaps not entirely. You know, for example, um, there may be situations where um, experts uh, uh, can be dealt with virtually um, without losing anything uh, from the, the process. And uh, that's, uh, I think, already um, been, been accepted. Um, and in the... I think the the code word or the key word in terms of moving forward is going to be flexibility. I think um, the, the parties and the uh, the decision makers have realized that having a flexible process, not necessarily just doing everything the way we've always dealt with it, um, is, is the way to go. And uh, you know, it, what's surprised me is, is how flexible. Um, what uh, I've always regarded as being inflexible process can, can become rapidly, even in terms of, you know, uh, I've been involved in, in several hearings where, you know, the technology doesn't quite work uh, and you have to stop and, and, and recalibrate. And, you know, there was a time where I think people would react to that with impatience and, and, uh, and uh, simply uh, throw up their hands and, and so forth. Now, you know, people seem prepared to, to accept the fact there'll be problems, but they can be dealt with and um, the, the, an efficient process can still be achieved. That's true. Uh, flexibility has been an important lesson. Um, uh, a quick word on mediation, Justice Mittal, uh, as we approach past uh, the end time, you've been one of the foremost voices uh, uh, and in fact, institution builders on the mediation side in India. Uh, do you feel like uh, uh, that we've made significant strides in India uh, to encourage mediation? Where does mediation fall in the larger uh, scheme of things in terms of the options that parties have to resolve their disputes? Uh, and maybe perhaps start with what is mediation uh, relative to uh, arbitration and going to the courts? The basic difference, Jafar, between arbitration and mediation is that not only do you choose the assistance of an independent trained personnel uh, to, uh, in your dispute resolution, but you choose him to help you facilitate the outcome. He or she does not decide what will be the adjudication, but you negotiate uh, the terms on which you want to resolve your dispute and you, and if you're able to arrive at a negotiated settlement, that is the outcome of the dispute resolution process by mediation. As against an arbitration where the arbitration arbitrator writes said the word or the court where the judge hands down a judgment. So this is the biggest advantage. There is confidentiality and privacy of parties is maintained and uh, the confidentiality is to the extent that even the court cannot ask what happened to be in the mediation process, in the parties' discussions between the mediator and the parties. So the parties have a strong, have a larger sense of comfort, you know. And the what I have experienced, why I'm such a strong advocate of mediation is that, you know, even if you're not able to resolve the dispute, but a good mediator will guide the parties into a position 
where you may be warring when you enter the mediator's room, but at the end of it, you agree to disagree. So you will shake hands even when you're breaking off the mediation and you will respond to each other in court. And I found the, the tension level in the courtroom visibly reduced, even if parties had not been able to resolve the dispute and we had to continue with the litigation. But a lot of times you send the parties to mediation, the case comes unresolved, you proceed with the case, you talk to the parties, you groom them, as you may say, you send them back to a mediator, sometimes you change the mediator, and after some time, normally, parties are able to resolve the disputes. But whatever be it, the, the, the sense of peace in the community, in the courtroom, in the family is much, much you know, better than it was when they agreed to go to the mediation. Yes, I really advocate mediation in a large way. And a legislature has recognized the benefits. They've introduced mediation into Consumer Protection Act. There's a requirement mandatory of free litigation mediation in the Commercial Courts Act, the Companies Act, the Real Estate Regulatory Authority Act. You know, more and more legislations have recognized the, the importance of mediation, but there are certain vacuums, certain areas which need to be addressed. And you are aware of the Singapore Convention, which happened very recently, and about 53 countries have signed it, you know. This is to enable cross-border mediation uh, to get recognition and enforcement of outcomes of media, you know, mediation settlements in matters which were, you know, cross-border. And a very, very important development. India is now in the process of finalizing its domestic legislation on mediation to find, you know, give a, a formal uh, shape to accreditation, to trainings, to regulation of mediators, uh, etc. You know, which is another significant uh, milestone. You know, which we will achieve. The legislation has already been put in the public domain, inviting public objections. That's very, very uh, useful, uh, Justice Mitchell, to hear, I'm sure, for businesses um, um, when they're looking at uh, disputes. But Jeff, how, how uh, worthwhile is it for a party uh, to choose in the first instance mediation? Or is it uh, something that a judge must nudge a party to? Uh, when, how can a business decide that it will be the first mover to opt for mediation instead of an adversarial uh, mechanism like an arbitration or in court? Well, um, just before I answer that, I, I should tell you that um, I, uh, I shouldn't have talked about uh, flexibility and uh, technological problems because as soon as I did that, my, my screen froze. So I uh, had missed part of uh, the, the conversation, but uh, I think I'm back up now. Um, in, in Canada, we have a very strong, well-established um, approach to, to mediation um, for uh, pretty much uh, uh, the, as long as I've been practicing, which is over 40 years, um, there has been the view that um, parties should be encouraged to try to resolve their disputes, uh, either before they get to, to litigation or arbitration or at some point during the, the process. And so um, in my experience in Canada, there are very, very few uh, disputes that uh, uh, get to trial that where there won't have been uh, a sincere effort to uh, try to resolve the dispute through using a neutral, uh, through a mediated, process. And I think the culture here is such that, you know, suggesting mediation is no longer viewed as a sign of weakness or, or a sign that you don't have confidence in your dispute. That um, it, that's just a kind of history as far as we're concerned. In, in Canada, um, it's, it's expected that um, you'll sit down and, and uh, try to uh, to deal with the, the, the issue through um, mediation um, in sometimes more than once, um, sometimes before and then during a, a case and so forth. Um, 
And my experience, because I've done a lot of mediation, both as counsel and as, uh, as neutral, is that um, frequently, uh, even the most hard-nosed hard uh, commercial parties want to be able to tell their story. They want somebody who's a neutral to just listen to what they have to say, and then they're prepared to take the step to try to resolve it with the whether on their own or with assistance assistance of a neutral. And I think that's what happens frequently uh, here in terms of uh, of, of mediation. That uh, the parties, um, uh, having known knowing that they've had their in effect day, not at their day in court, but their day to, to give their side of the story, become much more amenable to try and negotiate. And of course, um, resolving a dispute um, is, is often uh, a much better uh, result for commercial parties because you have uh, the certainty. You, you don't roll the dice in, in terms of, of going further to uh, a proceeding where you, you can't control the result. And obviously there's the cost savings as well, but in it, we do have a, a very strong um, ADR culture. Uh, we have a, um, a, a, a very significant number of uh, skilled uh, mediators who are, are, are fair and uh, know how to uh, facilitate the parties uh, uh, efforts to, to resolve their own disputes. And we have a very um, multicultural and diverse bar that will uh, uh, you know, take into account and accommodate um, uh, parties in a way that I think they will feel comfortable. Now, Canada has not signed the, the Singapore uh, Convention, I think in part because um, it would probably take all of uh, uh, consent from all of the Canadian provinces to, to uh, for that to be uh, effective. And you know, I think there is um, some question as to whether um, the the convention and and its requirements uh, are either necessary or appropriate, such as you know, whether a, a mediator um, uh, should have to attest and sign. To a settlement agreement, does that just open up a whole new uh, area for people to challenge uh, uh, what what is really just a contract between the parties? Um, and is that going to result in mediators being dragged into proceedings uh, and and so forth? I mean, our courts here um, have uh, said in in numerous decisions that uh, you know. Settlements reached in mediation and, and minutes of settlement that comes from mediation will be enforced by the court. And uh, there's absolutely no doubt uh, about that. Um, you know whether you're signatory to a convention or or not. So I think um, even as somebody who uh, you know has spent uh, their career in the courtroom uh, doing. Uh, trials and, and trying to, uh, or in arbitration hearings, um, I think it's your responsibility really as a, as a barrister to recognize that um, you know, you should, that a bona fide attempt to, to mediate a dispute is very much part of the process and, uh, and should be um, given effect to. Uh, as, and as well, um, you know, often, um, Parties uh, like to have a process with uh, a med R process so that you, you try and mediate a dispute, but if you can't, then you, you move on to, to arbitration uh, so that um, you're, you take advantage of, uh, of, of, of both uh, processes in terms of trying to come up with a, a resolution. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that, that's uh, helpful. Um, I've gone on uh, to ask you questions and I could go on for a lot longer. There's many, many interesting things that uh, you've, you've given us, uh, the both of you. Um, but I'm sure that the audience would like to ask the question. Uh, and perhaps we can open uh, the scene to them. Uh, Samit? Yeah, Jafar, I, I think it's been really a very interest, very interesting discussion. And uh, I mean, you all could go on talking and but we could also go on listening, but says a lot. 
for the discussion. So I think we've already got one. Um, yeah, we've got uh, just a comment. I'm just, uh, yeah, maybe five minutes. If if uh, Jeff and Justice Mittal are okay with the timing, then maybe we could do five minutes. Anybody has any questions, we could uh, ask them or else uh, they could probably mail it to us and we could uh, mail it. So we've already got one. Uh, see, five minutes. Nadra, there's only two comments in the chat box. There's okay. no questions. Yeah. There's no question. So maybe what we can do then is that if whenever the please everybody whoever has got any questions, uh, feel free to mail us at uh, ICBC Shivani. If you can just put in our mail ID, and we could then uh, you know share it with you all. But uh, uh, Jafar, if you would like to just summarize and thank the panelists, uh, thank Justice Mittal and Jeff, and then we could probably ask Arun Pandya at Air Canada to just say a few words uh, to close the session. Of course, uh, in, uh, immense gratitude uh, to the both of you, Justice Mittal and Jeff, uh, for sparing so much time and so generously telling us about uh, the details uh, of the legislation and, and case law from your respective jurisdictions and sharing with us really your experience. That's priceless uh, uh, for me as a practitioner and I'm sure uh, for the business people that uh, form our audience. Um, uh, so, and thank you to ICBC. Uh, I think this was a very thoughtfully chosen topic uh, and I hope that in the years to come, uh, you know, legal speak uh, forms an important part of uh, your endeavors. Um, because obviously knowing the law and knowing how the law might help you uh, and knowing what might come up against you, uh, uh, these are all important things for businesses to know and to feel comfortable really with the legal regimes of the countries that businesses operate in. Uh, I think uh, it, it would continue to be very, very helpful if business organizations such as yours, uh, uh, Ms. Hamid, uh, you know, help lawyers uh, speak in an informal way uh, to businesses uh, and uh, businesses feel uh, legal personnel are accessible to them, uh, uh, generally speaking, and they don't fear the prospect of the dispute. Uh, I think there's from uh, one of the important things that I've drawn from the discussion uh, from Justice Mittal and Jeff is that there's such a variety of options and uh, the legislatures as well as of the respective countries and the court systems are very sensitive uh, to the fact that businesses want their disputes resolved uh, quickly, efficiently, uh, and at least cost, and are trying to do their best to, to create an environment uh, where that might be possible. Um, so thank you very much once again, Justice Mittal. See you in an arbitration You're soon. <laughs> uh, uh, and thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, hopefully see you soon, either in Canada or in India. Uh, I don't know if you'd have the chance to travel here. Uh, I, I hope you do, so we can meet. Uh, and and thank you. Uh, so passing the bit on on to uh, Mr. Arun Pandya. Yeah. So uh, yeah, while Arun takes it now that we you know decided to do away with the Q and A, we've suddenly got a whole uh, you know range yes. of questions that have come in. Uh, uh, would you like to quickly answer any of them if they if they quick ones or are they uh, you know? No, they are. They require long answers. You know, Jeff wouldn't know the nuances of Section 34, and the person wants to know how long does a Section 34 kind of objection take in Canada. Yeah. So, okay. So then yeah. let's leave it. We will answer. And what we will do is that this is a really a very interesting topic. And I would like to take this discussion forward. Uh, you know, we must have some more because this is like, as you said, mediation is the answer. And now that we have these virtual sessions possible, I think we would, the chamber would like to take, uh, you know, a step in trying to be an, uh, you know, somewhat involved in an arbitration cell, uh, you know, putting up an arbitration arbitration cell, which can help facilitate between India and Canada. Yes. So yes, I think exactly. with your guidance and advice, Justice Mittal, and with the support of uh, Niti and, uh, you know, uh, Arun Pandya, <laughs> uh, Jeff and Jafar, I think we will start having some more workshops on this. And Great. This on yeah. Good idea. Yeah. So from ICBC, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. And Arun, uh, if you'd like to say a few words, uh, everyone's just waiting to get onto the flight. So can you tell us a little more about that? Over to you, Arun. So, so firstly, I must mention that long time back in a conversation with Justice Mittal, 
she talked about arbitration and dispute resolution uh, as a topic and it kind of triggered me to think how important this topic has become because of the covid and otherwise and that's how it drove me to nadira and we had a discussion and hence this session so justice mithil thank you very much for You're taking welcome. the on jeff lots of thanks to you for taking time out to be on this panel neeti and jafar you put it together very very nicely i must say and icbc air air canada has always supported icbc and shall continue to do so i just wanted to mention one correction that nadira uh, when she was speaking about air canada so we have now 10 flights a week to toronto so 10 flights a week to toronto direct non stop we have a daily flight to vancouver no flight from mumbai at the moment but we have started a new route which is a direct flight to montreal from delhi and i must confess all the flights are full 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 so i don't know what's happening but there is that pent up demand that seems to be traveling and it's also a validation of the fact that cross section of people are traveling so students business people Uh, people parents who want to visit their families etc and we are really looking forward now jafar you have to book your ticket quickly and justice mithil we have to take you to canada asap and jeff i hope you will make it to india soon rather than later so uh, with that I and neeti i haven't I forgotten neeti oh fantastic So I haven't forgotten. I'm a big fan of Air Canada. Basically. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the new Aeroplan uh, frequent flyer program, which is really doing well now. So uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank Nadira, Shivani, everybody who put it together, and look forward to more such events or uh, fireside chats. where we can have all of you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you arun and this leadership uh, you know the leader speak series is going to be an annual initiative with air canada and icbc so i'm, I'm absolutely. Very, absolutely very very yeah, we're very privileged to partner with air canada on this with this thank you to all of you good night and have a good day to canada thank, thank you bye bye thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.